Thank you, Diane. It's a privilege to uh, count myself and my colleagues as, uh, as members of this group. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I want to, as always, this is, this is the fifth time that, uh, that, that we're here sponsoring this event. And uh, we, as some of you know, launched the company here. We announced Trinetics in 2014 during this exact conference. And uh, it seems to be a tradition that we come back every year and give a little update on what we've been up to. So let me spend a few minutes of your time talking about Trinetics. Um, and you know, if, if there are questions, we'll be around to answer them during the day today and tomorrow. So Trinetics to me is these four basic uh, things. There, there's an idea behind the company. There's a network that we're, that we're working on building. There's a data asset that uh, we're cultivating. And finally, there's actionable analytics uh, that we're putting on top of, of these uh, platforms and the, the data assets. And so the idea behind the company, this notion that we're going to provide a sustainable private-public partnership to use data for secondary purposes, specifically for research, is a really powerful one. And as many of the folks in this room know, it hasn't been so easy to accomplish. Uh, the Longwood has seen a lot of spilled blood, sweat and tears, uh, you know, right across the street to, to get this to go. We're finally at the point where the conversation about data sharing is going on. Uh, C-suites are open to the idea and, uh, and we're accelerating. We want to liberate the data. We want to get it out of the primary source systems. We want to be able to make it available to researchers. We want to further democratize research. We want it to become available to a broader audience, uh, as, in fact, as broad as possible. The network we're building is first and foremost people. We're trying to connect pharma researchers, CROs, academic researchers, healthcare providers, so that there's an ongoing conversation about what needs to be done, what's the optimal way of doing it. We're building a physical federated database. Your data remains behind your firewall. We bring questions to the data. And we're building a software platform on top of it to enable highly performant uh, ability to query the data across this uh, federated network. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention semantics. Trinetics takes care of mapping your data to a common set of standards so that these federated, uh, the federated analytics is actually possible. Uh, the data is mainly sourced from the, from the uh, EHR systems. Uh, the plus here on the slide denotes cancer registries, molecular genomics, and more and more data as we go on. We're very sort of bullish on uh, the notion of data expansion. We curate the data. We try to add additional facts uh, by pre-calculating things like GFR, for example, when we encounter sodium creatinine and so on. We work very diligently on data quality. There's some very interesting stuff that can be done when we have dozens of healthcare data providers where we can line things up and uh, compare data quality metrics. And then finally, uh, in the analytics front, we started with the notion of optimizing clinical trials. We wanted to make sure that we put the process of site identification and patient identification uh, on the basis of data as opposed to the quote unquote art that is, that is being practiced. And uh, we're graduating, we're taking the next logical step, harnessing the power of this network and the data asset to go toward research. Um, yes, we've been here before. So uh, as, far as, as far as updates go, we are rapidly growing. Uh, there is on one side, uh, a healthy and growing network of data providers. These are some of the, some of the uh, logos. They range from academic institutions to chains of hospitals, to specialty care providers. On the other side, we have a lot of paying sponsors, basically a who, who's who of the top pharmaceutical companies. So you see Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Lilly and Sanofi and Novartis and so on. There are top CROs like IQVIA uh, and, and that list is also growing. And then as far as geography, we are rapidly growing as well. So 
we are still prevalent in the United States. Majority of the data is US based, but there's a lot of data coming from Europe. We just yesterday signed our first site in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. We have sites in Japan, in, uh, in the Middle East, in the Far East, in Australia. It's really fantastic. It's really scary from my perspective to face the uh, harmonization of all of that uh, international data, but that's what we are signing up to do. And the last, last slide, before I give you a quick demo, I wanted to show is just the, the numbers update. Last year, I think we made a claim that we're growing, we're doubling year over year. Some of these numbers uh, are very much in that, in that uh, rate of growth. So we stopped counting the total number of patients under contract, kind of difficult to estimate, but it's well over 100 million. Currently on live network, we have 53.6 million patients that can be searched. That's 13 billion facts um, and 44 uh, data providers who are currently on the network. 82 organizations signed up to provide data. Um, 24 paying customers, I mentioned geography, we're across 14 countries. And then as far as clinical trials are concerned, almost 7,000 protocols have been analyzed by various pharma and CRO on the system from the, for the purposes of feasibility work and clinical trial uh, site selection. And uh, 1,600 or so individual opportunities have been presented uh, to data providers to accept a trial at, at their individual institutions. So with that said, let me see if I can give you a very quick demo. So I have, I have a pre-made query. Uh, I'm going to drop these guys off just to show you how quick and easy it is to uh, create a list of uh, criteria to describe a cohort of, oh, a cohort of patients. Um, I'm going to be talking about warfarin and apixaban, so I'm just finding some medications here. Um, we have synonyms, so if you put in a brand name, it's easy to find things, uh, easy, easy to interact with uh, the standards that underlie the system. For labs, for example, we're able to show you distribution of values across the entire network. Um, you can focus on the most recent result, you can focus on results ever. You can find patients whose INR, for example, is greater than three. Uh, you can create various Boolean uh, logic up, uh, constructs, make them arbitrarily complex. You can create temporal events. You can tie things to a calendar. You can create sequences of events uh, to, to describe the temporal relationships uh, between them. There's a lot of complexity, which I'm not going to go into. One thing I do want to do so the network that we're going to run this query against is composed of 35 sites. There's the folks who don't object to us using this for demonstration purposes, uh, covering 37 and a half million patients. So I'm going to press this button. I'm going to count patients who are either on warfarin or Eloquist and have elevated INR, not necessarily clinically relevant question, but just to show the platform. So if you don't mind counting the seconds with me, let's see how long it takes. Done, done, <laughs> done. <laughs> so this just went across the globe. There are live sites in, uh, in Europe, uh, all across the, the United States, and it plowed through billions of facts. And that's, that's the representative. In fact, it was a little slow because I don't want the connection. But that's the representative performance of this platform. The results come back. <laughs> literally in seconds. It's very, very impressive. Um, but the reason the reason I wanted to do, oh, and one more thing I put here on the list just so, so that I don't forget, is the whole idea of genomics and trying to work on seamless integration to the extent, uh, to the extent possible of phenotypic data with the genotypic data. We're still early in that journey. We're still a little light on the data. So here's a gene that seems to be involved in familial atrial fibrillation. I just brought it here as an example, but we can support various uh, mutations 
we can we can support tissues that were that were well, doesn't really matter the tissues that were sampled um, to do the biopsy wild types etc and that that data asset is uh, is rapidly growing what i wanted to spend majority of the remaining time on is the notion of analytics for for research so let me bring up another study here is here is a clinical question um, patient has atrial fibrillation we need to anticoagulate the question is do i put them on warfarin or do i put them on eloquence and one of the considerations is what is the likelihood of hemorrhagic stroke in these patients so let's try to ask this exact question so we're going to construct two cohorts one will have patients with afib and then they will be treated with warfarin for anticoagulation uh, the, the definition of the cohort is complicated i want to make sure they're not on a pixaban uh, and so on and then i will create another query another cohort that is a mirror image patients with afib but now they are on a pixaban and i want to make sure they're not on warfarin once we create these two cohorts I'm going to go into the new feature that we announced about a month ago. And uh, I am going to, folks are using this, so I, I don't want to actually rerun this in the interest of time. I want to show you results that were already generated. So I'm going to go here into the history, pull this up. So. We have two cohorts that we will that we will compare side by side. Blue is Eliquis, green is Warfarin. The kind of next logical question you want to ask is how comparable are these two cohorts? Can I can I meaningfully compare them or are they very different? And so I will say that I'm going to go a year back in time from the index event, and the index event I'm going to define as beginning of the therapy either warfarin or uh, eloquis and i can do things like comparison of their demographics so mean ages seem to be very similar breakdown by gender seems to be very similar etc i can look at the comorbidities that that these two cohorts have and take a look at the at the frequency with which they have let's say hypertension metabolic disease and so on uh, currently it's a visual comparison we're working on propensity matching with different algorithms that will become available shortly so imagine that you can that you can do this comparison of the cohort side by side, right? You can look at labs and do things like uh, oh, I don't know. Let's see. Um, let's say PT. So blue is blue is. Uh, I really wish this were a map here. <laughs> Uh, blue is eloquence. See, it doesn't it doesn't increase the PT as you know. Green is warfarin. It does. So, lots of lots of power here in terms of comparing comparing cohorts side by side. The next question is to define the outcome that I'm interested in, and my outcome is hemorrhagic stroke. So, what I'm going to say is, from the index event, from the start of the therapy, I want to go forward seven days, and then from that point, I'm going to go into the future. For two years, let's say. So that's my time frame that I will observe this this population of patients for the outcome, right? And we will define the outcome as right here, hemorrhagic strokes. And then we'll go, we'll hit the button in real life, and this will crunch for about a minute or less, and it will come back and it will say something along the lines of uh, as far as measures of association the risk of getting a hemorrhagic stroke is indeed higher in warfarin it looks something like this uh, in fact it's statistically significant in this case we can ask for a couple of mile curve looking for how long it takes to get to this to this outcome how long it takes to get to the stroke and uh, i can blow up this graph and you will see that the green the warfarin diverges and uh, it's actually lower. I mean, it's not a dramatic difference, but you can see that there is a difference in uh, 
in how quickly people get to the uh, to the stroke if they are on on uh, warfarin as opposed to eloquist. And then lastly, again, not necessarily clinically, clinically significant, but you can use a lab as an outcome. And in this case, you see the the green the green distribution of INR in warfarin. It's increased. The blue is around one for eloquist. Doesn't increase your INR. Just sort of clinical confirmation that these things behave as you would as you would expect. So this this was demonstrated. So now you can imagine that in this class of questions, you can ask a lot of very interesting and very clinically relevant uh, things, get the results very quickly, essentially at the speed of thought. And the remarkable part about this is it's built on a distributed federated platform. We're not aggregating the data. We're not running this on a single database. It's actually run on a globally distributed uh, federated network. And with that, uh, it's a pleasure to, to represent a company that's sponsoring this event. Thank you very much.